one of the uh, features I love like on Google Photos or even on Facebook is every day a picture pops up, where were you a year ago? <clears throat> Sometimes it's hard to remember where I was a week ago, let alone a year ago. And some of these pictures, uh, I find it hard to believe that that was me on a camel or doing this or doing that. Many of my pictures nowadays are from the final days of my sabbatical. And during Holy Week, a year ago, I was in Jerusalem. And one of the places that really captured my imagination was the upper room. The upper room is a phrase, a place in the New Testament that's very evocative. And uh, the city of Jerusalem is a walled city. And there are a number of gates, and each gate, if you go out it, eventually will lead you to the place the gate is named after. So if you go out the Damascus gate, and you walk long enough, you'll be in Damascus. One of the oldest gates is Zion Gate, and that takes you uh, a short distance to Mount Zion. And you can begin to climb to the top of Mount Zion, one of the places rich in biblical history for both Jews and Christians. And as you're walking along these labyrinth of cobblestone roads, you pass a building that you can tell is a very old building, but it isn't a striking building. Uh, one of the things about Israel is everything has 5,000 years of history. So the same place can mean very different things to different people. On the first floor of this building, Jews believe this is the place that venerates the remains of King David. And his remains are there. It's a highly disputed question as to where King David actually is buried. If you have five hours to kill, ask a rabbi where King David is buried, and you'll hear every theory possible. But on the second floor is the place that Christians venerate as the upper room. And this is the place where Jesus instructed the apostles to prepare for the Passover. This is the place where he washed the feet of the apostles. This is the place where the Eucharist was instituted, the place where the priesthood was instituted. It's the place that the apostles and disciples fled to after the crucifixion for fear of the Roman authorities in the Sanhedrin. This was the place that many of the post-resurrection appearances of the risen Christ took place, most notably when he visited Doubting Thomas, whose doubts were relinquished. This is the place that the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, and a case could be made that this was the first Christian church. And so it's an overwhelming place. You know, when we think of the upper room, it can be a physical place, or it can be a spiritual place. You know, a spiritual director might say to you, where's your upper room? Where is the place that you go to be safe, to be re-energized, to be born again? Where is the place that you feel most at home? You know, I guess in modern, modern parlance, the question might be, where is your happy place, I suppose? Where is this place that I can go? Is it the Cook County bike trail? Is it a cottage up in the North Woods? Is it the family room in your memory of your childhood? Is there a place that you go to escape the anxieties and the fears and the stresses of daily life? We all hopefully have those upper rooms. We hear in the scriptures today, one of the three times in the scriptures, and it's a common mandate of the Lord, be not afraid, fear not. You know, and one of the toxic realities of life is the force that fear can take in our journeys. And there can be a wide degree of what that word fear means. You know, it could be simple as simple as, got to pick up the kids at Roosevelt Pool, and I've got five minutes to do this, and you're on Glenview Road, and the rail rate things go down. <laughs> and then the train goes by, and... It's the double whammy. It's the train coming in the other direction. <laughs> and then that finally leaves the station, a sigh of relief, and then a freight train. So all of a sudden, it's 20 minutes. But there's many different kinds of fears that keep us up at night. The fear of the results of a biopsy. 
The fear that can take place in a number of workplaces now of a reduction in the workforce that can make people very anxious. You know, this past spring, it just struck me more than usual, just the fears that a senior in high school can have about what college I'm going to. You know, it's such a big decision. And, you know, it's a source of enormous fear waiting for the news of where I will be going next year to be, continue my studies. There can be the fear that keeps a parent awake at night when I know there's, not, there's something not right with my son or daughter. There's just something not right. There can be the fear of flying. There can be the fear of falling. There can be all sorts of fears that work their way into our lives. And we hear this phrase, be not afraid, be not afraid. And I think if we look at that more deeply, we realize that Jesus was not a magician. He didn't see faith as, you know, I snap my fingers and all your fears go away, or I wave the magic wand and all of a sudden I'm on the yellow brick road without a care in the world. Fear is real. He dealt with real fear. He dealt with the fear of rejection, of violence, the fear of being marginalized, the fear of constantly being upsetting to people. And he found a way of dealing with that fear through his faith, his relationship with the Father and the Spirit. And what can we learn about how we can cope with fear? How can we better handle the fears and the stresses that happen in life? We went around this church this morning, and I pretended like I was Oprah Winfrey, and I had a microphone, and I said to you, what, did, what are you bringing to the church this morning? We'd be astounded with just this group of people, the stuff that's going on, the stuff that's going on, stuff we might know this person fairly well, have no idea what they're dealing with, with their families or their work. Uh, I have a, sis, a niece of mine who is a physical therapist, and she uh, works with a lot of patients that are dealing with hip replacements, knee replacements, maybe they fell and fractured several bones. And the fear that can take over of, will I ever be able to climb up a flight of stairs again? <laughs> will I be able to dress myself? Will I ever be able to feed myself? I mean, very basic things that when your life gets thrown up upside down and inside out, it's a, it, it's a power to deal with. And how do we move through these moments of fear? It's very interesting, the amount of studies that have been done in recent years, uh, really interviewing doctors, medical doctors, who will tell you that when I have a patient that's a person of faith, they move through the process of illness and recovery in a better way than, than others that don't. That their faith in the love of God and his presence is going to get me through because it's real. I can't get out of bed right now. Or I have to deal with chemotherapy that takes every ounce of my energy away. Or I have to deal with the uncertainty of not sure where life is headed. And to know that the Lord is at our side is an enormous source of comfort. The Lord does not abandon us when we are afraid. He is at our side. And how do we cultivate this relationship so that we have this sense of being with the Lord as we face the turbulence that can often surround us in life? And one of the key ways of cultivating that sense of that relationship is what you're doing right now, gathered in the Lord's house on this beautiful morning to praise God for his gifts and his blessings. There can be no greater sense of calming the turbulence of life than to come to the Lord's table and to receive the body and blood of the Lord. That gives us strength that can last the whole week. There can be no greater source of hope than to hear the word of God proclaimed, reminding us of this great love story that the God of life has for each of us, being reminded every time we gather that Jesus Christ can redeem us, 
that Jesus Christ can heal us. Jesus Christ can give us whatever it is that we need to get through this day, this week, this month, this difficult period of my life, that somehow Christ is there, right there. But if we don't make time to cultivate that relationship, if we're not being fed spiritually, all of a sudden the fears take over. The isolation settles in. The discouragement becomes very real and evident as we look at the relationships in our life and where we see ourselves going. What a blessed gift it is. Those words, do not be afraid, have a much deeper meaning when we realize we will not ultimately be afraid if we appreciate that the Lord is there, Jesus Christ, our Savior, right there to escort us as we enter the turbulence and also the blessings of life. Today, we have the great privilege of celebrating with our ministers of care, and I hear over and over again in the parish of the difference a minister of care has made in the lives of our parishioners. Those who are homebound or infirm, you know, talk about being afraid. Talk about wondering what's happening when you're alone is overwhelming. And over time, our care ministers develop relationships that really become like family with some of our parishioners. How often I'll hear someone say, you know, that minister has no idea, mom waits all week for him to come and to pray with, me, with her and to catch up on what happened the previous week. This is kind of the front line of what it means to be a community of faith, to go where it hurts, to be with those in a nursing home or a hospital room that just are overwhelmed by the circumstances and just praying and receiving the Eucharist can be the greatest medicine in the world and feeling connected and cared for. And so we pray in gratitude for these parishioners who uh, reach out to those uh, most vulnerable in our parish community. We praise the God of life who invites us to not be afraid, but to trust and to love. Thank you for joining us for this celebration of the Mass. This virtual Mass is broadcast to hundreds of people every day of the week. You know, over 100 years ago, the very first celebrations of the Mass took place on the second floor of the Glenview Public House. It's been inconceivable that 100 years later, we would be reaching so many people all over the world through this technology. If you'd like to support the ongoing broadcasts of OLPH's Masses, please go to our website, go to Give Central, and you'd be able to support the ongoing outreach of this virtual ministry. Thank you for your support. Most of all, thank you for joining us in prayer. God bless you.